things like mind, things like will, things like purpose, all of these invisible patterns that constrain reality, uh, uh, the I, ones that go beyond I love the, the way the you're natural. talking, Jonathan. That's that's you're talking like an, a, an engineer. Uh, but to understand life today, you have to think like a design engineer to understand the universe. You have mm. to those fine tuning parameters I was talking about in physics. Those are nothing more than highly improbable constraints on what matter is allowed to do by the fundamental laws of nature. Um, and we find in order to move from all the possible ways of arranging matter that there are to the ways that manifest themselves in life, hmm. one constraint after another has to be applied to those that, that, that those huge ensembles of possibilities have to be narrowed to get something that we would recognize as life and that is that that um, well that makes life possible let's just say that yeah and so yeah, the the engineering constraints that are necessary to produce a cell are immense uh and highly improbable and they also represent inputs of information this was the basic insight of the uh early information scientists like like uh like weaver and others uh, um uh the idea that information involves the the uh re restriction of possibilities in fact, we measure information today that way. If I flip a coin and it comes up head, well, let's, let's do it with zeros and ones in the computer world. If I if I get a one, I've eliminated a zero. So there are two possibilities. I've constrained the possibilities and elected one and eliminated another, and that's one bit of information. And so we 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 now have a way of quantifying this idea of informational constraint. And the DNA is nothing more. Well, it's a lot. It's a lot of different things, but it is also a a, a series of, of restrictions. You've got four mm -hmm. possibilities at each side along the DNA molecule. It's a, not a, a binary code, but a quaternary code. And so at each po point, one of the four options is elected and three are eliminated. And therefore a quantifiable amount of information is, is, is imparted or stored at that point. And it turns out that that information is also importantly functional because it's directing the construction of the proteins and protein machines. Yeah. And I mean, what's fascinating to me is that even when I hear the Darwinian argument to say that it's it's just random mutation and then natural selection, it's like what are, even the even the term natural selection, what exactly? So you're saying so being has a tendency to persist, and being has a tendency to be autopoetic and to constrain reality is in a manner that non-living beings do not have. And that type of constraint, even though we don't even necessarily have mind at the, at the outset, like at the lowest forms, but that type of constraint already looks like what mind does at a higher levels. And so, you know, like you said, like the idea of saying that we can notice that this type of constraint, even in the world of biology, is already there in the structures themselves. And and then, but then at some point, thinking, well, then we can't go any further than that. Like we, we notice that that actually does what it, what we need, what we need for it to happen, for it to constrain reality in a way that goes beyond random, just randomness uh, that, that analog analogically you would be able to infer that then mind is an aspect of the universe that constrains matter. Like this it already is, is in life. Is, like why does it bother really you? really a key insight you have that, that um, I'm thinking back on, on uh, Shannon, Claude Shannon and, uh, and Weaver, who developed information theory in the first place, and the idea was that any reduction of uncertainty uh, is is uh, results in a corresponding input of information. But the, and so that's a, what we can think of. In the, the idea of imparting information is also a way of constraining things. But what we also know from our experience, our uniform and repeated experience, which is the basis of all scientific reasoning, is that uh, if we have a big input of information into a system. It's always come from a mind, whether we're mm -hmm. talking about a computer program or a paragraph in a book or a, her a hieroglyphic inscription, or we're transmitting information now across the internet. Um, and so, but where does that information come from? It comes from a mind. And that kind of makes sense when you think of, or in, from intelligence. Well, what is the, the, the Latin root for intelligence is interlego. It's to choose between. Mm -hmm. That's what minds do. They choose between. And, and in the in the most basic sense information is choosing between between a zero and a one between a a or a c or a g or a t and so what we find in life is stored information in dna 
suggesting a prior act, the prior activity of a mind in in choosing between the options to elect the one that's there present. Uh, and so the, the, there are a lot of deep concepts here, but I, I think that the from the standpoint of evolutionary theory, there and and you brought up the whole question of of, of random mutations. The the evolutionary mechanisms do not and are not providing adequate explanations for the origin of information. Mm -hmm. Let's just look at your yeah. the, the, the 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 mutation selection idea for a minute. If if in fact the uh, a section of DNA containing information for building a protein is uh, alphabetic or digital in character. And it is. Leroy Hood, our famous biotech uh, expert out here in the Seattle area, just says DNA is contains dig digital code. Richard Dawkins says it's like a machine code. Uh, Francis Crick uh, <clears throat> made very clear that it stored um, information and not just information in a mathematical sense, but information that was also functional. Um, yeah, constra like the, the, yeah, yeah, it's a constraining factor. It's right, a, it, right. it, it's it's a it commanding. It's, it, it's giving it, orders. It, it, exactly. Uh, uh, Bill Gates, our also other local hero in the Seattle area, says uh, DNA is like a software program, but much mm -hmm. more complex than any we've devised. So, what, well, what do we know about software information in a digital form? Well, if it's functional, we know that you can't change it very much without degrading its function and very quickly uh, causing it to lose function altogether. But what do what do uh, do the Darwinians uh, propose as the, the mechanism by which new form is, uh, is generated? Well, they propose that you will have random changes in the section of a gene, the, the ACs, Gs, and T in a gene, um, and that, some, that many of those random changes will be degradative, but uh, occasionally you'll get lucky and you'll get a good one. And then that, that one will be will result in a new protein and that new protein will result in, uh, will, will combine with other proteins and form, form some sort of anatom new anatomical structure. And as those those uh, those um, changes accumulate, you'll eventually get new new form, new biological form and function, but there's a problem. And that's the problem, a problem we know well from our computer world. And that is that the functional sequences are so rare that if you begin to change the, the, the bit strings, you're inevitably, after very few changes, going to destroy the function long before you ever get to something new or functional. Mm -hmm. If I've got a section of code for building an app and I want to evolve it by random changes to generate a new app, I'm going to degrade and destroy the existing app long before I find a new series of characters that will give me a new app or a new operating system or something. And, and the reason for that is that the, the functional sequences are so rare among all the possible ways of arranging the zeros and ones in computer code. Or we can, think, do, we can do the same thought experiment with English text. If we've got a line of poetry, time and tide wait for no man, and we want to evolve it into a line from the Principia by Newton, uh, we can, we'll start to change the time and tide, and pretty soon we'll get... It, uh, in undecipherable gibberish yeah. long before we get a line from Newton or Hawking or or anybody else. So, and, and, and what's going on here? We What's going on is that in all linguistic systems or systems for conveying information digitally or alphabetically, the islands or the, the arrangements that are functional can be represented as little tiny islands separated from other little tiny islands by vast spaces of non-functional gibberish. There's a kind of an abyss between them. Mm -hmm. Now, does that, does that same kind of problem apply in biology? Well, it turns out it does. We have strong exper uh, uh, empirical evidence now that the sequences that form functional genes capable of building proteins are extremely rare among all the possible ways there are of arranging the ACs, Gs, and Ts in DNA, or arranging the amino acids, the 20 amino acids in the proteins. I have a colleague, Douglas Axe, who worked 14 years at Cambridge University to investigate the question, well, how rare or common are these uh, functional sequences? And for in, in, in studying a protein of modest length of about 150 amino acids in length, he discovered that for every sequence that will fold into a structure that's capable of doing a protein, a structure called a fold, there were 10 to the 74 power non-functional combinations. 
Well, what that means is that inevitably, then if you start changing the functional ones very much, you're going to fall into the non-functional abyss because there's just so many more of them in comparison to the ones you want. Now, in addition to that, since Axe has done this work, there've been other scientists who've gotten similar numbers, but there've been scientists, a scientist um, at the Weizmann Institute named Dan Tofik. Axe did his work at Cambridge University. Tofik um, has studied what are called, uh, uh, he studied proteins and he's, he, he mutates them intentionally, mm -hmm. but randomly. Mm -hmm. And he's found that after a very few number of mutations, that the, the, the stable structure called a fold will unravel. Yeah. And if it unravels, there's, it can't perform a function. There's nothing there to select. So, and the number of changes that are necessary to cause it to unravel are far, smewer, are far fewer than the number of changes that need to accumulate to build a new fold. Mm -hmm. So it's a can't get there from here problem. Not only are the functional genes and proteins very rare, they're highly isolated in what's called sequence space in the, in the space of all the possible ways there are of arranging the parts. Mm -hmm. So it's very much like the computer analogy. You start changing the zeros and ones, you're gonna destroy your computer program or your app long before you generate a new one by random changes. The same problem applies at the genetic level in biology. And that leaves a big unanswered question. How do you explain the origin of new information, the new information you would need to build a new protein, which is kind of the sine qua non of biological innovation. You gotta have mm -hmm. new proteins and new protein folds in particular, if you're gonna build anything.